Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So I'm happy to be here after some time. I can't remember how much time, but it's been a little while. See so many devotees here chanting the holy names of Krishna. And I believe today is a Hari Nam starting at four o'clock. You've been celebrating the holy name week, something like that. Is that right? It is said that Namas Chintamani Krishnas Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purno Shudo Niti Mukto Vinatvam Nama Namino. That the na holy name of Krishna is just like Chintamani. It's completely spiritual. And it is the source of all happiness or rasa. It is complete within itself, it's the source of everything. And Krishna and Krishna's name are non different. The whole aim of our Hare Krishna movement, especially in this age, is to experience Krishna. That's called Krishna consciousness. And gradually, as we make advancement in, in the Krishna consciousness movement, then the result is that we'll gradually believe that there is a Krishna. Shubhra once said one of the main problems in the Hare Krishna movement is that the devotees don't believe that there's a Krishna. So that's understandable. Krishna in Bhagavad Gita says, Naham Prakasha Sarvasha Yoga Maya Samavrita Murayam Nabhijananti Lokayam Ajam Avyam. That I, I'm never manifest to the foolish and unintelligent. For them, I'm covered by my eternal creative potency, Maya or Yoga Maya. And so the deluded world knows me not, whom unborn and inexhaustible. So Krishna is very kind. We've come to the material world to dream that we are Krishna or Radha or something like that. So Krishna is very kind. He won't wake us up as long as we want to keep on dreaming. After all, if he woke us up, it'd spoil all our dreams. Therefore, one has to develop, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, if you cannot fix your mind upon me without deviation, then follow the regular principles of bhakti yoga, and this way try to develop the desire to obtain me. So we're trying to develop the desire to become conscious of Krishna. Of course, if we follow the rules and regulations, then Krishna, Krishna's representatives in disciple succession, they can bestow their blessings upon us, and therefore this Daivi Prakar team, Ashritya, taking shelter of the divine energy, we can experience Ladini Shakti, or transcendental pleasure. After all, Everyone in the whole material universe, not only in B Mumbai, but even in Brahma Loka, they're only interested in three things. Does anyone know, know what three things everyone in the whole universe is interested in? Well, sense it, no, actually, not just sense it. Everyone is interested in knowing how to become as happy as possible as long as possible. Even when we say sense enjoyment, sense enjoyment is just a way of becoming happy or an attempt to become happy. But we want to become as happy as possible for as long as possible and therefore we're inquiring where the happiness is. Even the birds are going beep, 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 beep. I, I'm not very good. I don't know the language of the birds, but something like that. 
chirp, 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 chirp. Where is the worm? Because for a bird, the worm is happiness. Not for the worm, but for the bird. So everyone is looking for happiness, and we want to enjoy happiness for as long as possible. As spiritual souls, we're supposed to be enjoying happiness in the spiritual energy, especially in the ocean of happiness, and Krishna and Shimati Rarani and their associates, they are the, that ocean of happiness we're looking for. But in the material concept of life, we're actually believing some material circumstance is going to make me, if not happy, at least a little bit more peaceful. Therefore, we make so many arrangements, ultimately, to become peaceful. And peaceful in the material world means that I'm being a little protected from death. Why do people look both ways before they cross the street? Not to see if they, there's a car coming by that they can buy. <laughs> <laughs> they're looking both ways so that they can make sure they'll make it across the street why do people eat even prashadam generally eat because we're afraid if I don't eat you'll die or will die so everyone's afraid of death deha patya kala tradishu atma sanyesh satsupi Tesham pramato nidanam pashana pi na pashati. Shukadeva Priksha Maharaj, he asked the question to Shukadeva Goswami, and everyone was surprised. And Shukadeva Goswami was very pleased. He asked, What is the duty of a person who's about to die? If you go on the street, and you, some person passes by and you say, excuse me, sir, I have a question. He said, yes, how, I, I, what, where do you want to go? No, no, I'm just wondering, I'm about to die, what is my duty? Immediately they'll call the police and probably escort you someplace. <laughs> <laughs> or they'll call the ambulance and the people will come out with white coats and take you away. What did he say? He said he asked. He said he was about to die. What should he do? <laughs> so generally people don't ask these kind of questions. But Pariksha Maharaj, he has seven days to live, and he asked, what is my duty? I'm just about to die. And everyone was saying, you know, get a life insurance policy. <laughs> see if you can, you know, go on the internet, see if you can find a, a, an antidote for snake famine. Do your yoga exercises. Follow an Ayurvedic doctor, diet for a while. See if that will help. No, Shukadeva Goswami, he said, that's a fantastic question. People don't ask those kind of questions. They're just asking questions about how to make their house comfortable or secure, how to do, make their body firm and strong, how to squeeze out another two seconds out of life. But you're asking this because in human society, People are just mainly interested in nidraya riyate naktam vavavayena chavavaya. Nidra, ni, nidraya riyate naktam vavavayena chavavaya. Divya charte haya rajan kutumba bharanenava. At night, people are sleeping and they're dreaming of what they couldn't do during the day, they're dreaming about doing at night. And what do they do during the day? Work hard to get money. Money, money, sweeter than honey. <laughs> Why? Because then you can go to the store and buy so many things and fill up your house with so many things. And the more there, are, the more there is in the house, the more one's life is successful. 
and of course there's always sex enjoyment and buying and sleeping etc whatever but what is it all for atma sanyesha sasupi also that this body will be protected my family will protect me my dog will protect me if the yamadud has come to take me away my wife will have the first try at stopping them she'll come out with her chapati pin and <laughs> leave him alone and the children will jump on him and if worse comes to worse my dog will take care of them he's been trained but Pashana Pina Pashati, so many people have had nice dogs, nice families, nice houses, health insurance. They've done their yoga exercises and taken their vitamin pills every single day without fail. And they still have to leave their body. Although they may leave their body in a healthy state. I died, but I died in a healthily. So everyone has to leave their body. There is no cure for old age, disease, and death, except if one takes shelter of Krishna. Tasmat Bharata Sarvatma Bhagavan Ishvaro Hari Shavtasyas Kirti Tavyas Ja Smartavyak Chehatavayam. That one should hear about, one should chant about one should remember the Supreme Lord. Why? When I first joined the Hare Krishna movement in 1968, before that I was walking along one day at the University of Buffalo, well not at the University, I was living outside, but I was going to the University there. And just one day everything changed, my whole consciousness changed. It was, I didn't take any drugs, it just somehow or another Krishna arranged it, but my ch consciousness changed and I, I suddenly realized that the whole purpose of life was to become self-realized. And therefore, within a week, I became a vegetarian, started to do hatha yoga eight hours a day, read every book on self-realization, including the Bible and all kinds of books from India, do, started to do astrology, and go to school. But I knew that the purpose in life with self-realization. And then one of my friends who became a devotee also, Jagadish Prabhu, he told me about a temple. And I asked, what do they do there? And they said they chant these names, Hare Krishna. So I, saw, I thought, well, that's not very practical. <laughs> I mean, how can chanting make, help you become self-realized? In any case, there was nothing else in terms of self-realization, so I used to go down to this railroad shack. Railroad shack means there's a two-floor building made out of wood, and the temple room was more or less like a cave. Well, it was like it sunk down, so it was like a hole in the in the in the floor. And then they had these three. I, a wooden doll, which I thought I didn't know who they were, Lord Jagannath, Lord Baladev, and Shimati Subhadradev Maharani. And they were all on a shelf, on a bookshelf. And they were chanting Hare Krishna. So I thought, well, all right. I might as well chant also. So I started to chant, and I was chanting 25 rounds a day. In any case, I couldn't conceive that these sound vibration would make any difference. We didn't have so much philosophy back there. All we had was Srila Prabhupada's three original Srimad Bhagavatams. And I couldn't really understand so much about them. The first class I walked into in the morning, because morning program was the devotees got up at five o'clock in the morning there was no Mongol arti because there was no arti. We didn't know what an arti was. And we, then we had Srimad Bhagavatam class. And Srimad Bhagavatam class was just reading from the first canto that Prabhupada had translated. So I walked in and the first thing I heard was Ashvatama throwing a Brahmastra at Arjuna. And half the universe is being destroyed. So 
I was trying to figure out what this philosophy was all about. And then we didn't have a Bhagavad Gita. All we had was one page from Dr. Radhakrishna's book, a translation from the Bhagavad Gita. We had one verse. Denos minita dehe kamaram yovanam jara tata dahantara pravtira diryas tatra namuyati. And so one devotee, two devotees gave classes. There was Burjan Prabhu and Rupanuga Prabhu, and they gave the same class every day, or three times a week. that the embodied souls continually passing in a body going from boyhood to youth to old age so similarly the soul will pass to another body at the time of death the self-realized souls are not bewildered by such changes so I, I was thinking well this philosophy is not very deep <laughs> although I couldn't still understand it so three times a week I go to the University of Buffalo and the same verse same philosophy the body's changing etc but the soul's not changing. Of course, when I went to New Vrindavan in 1969, and Prabhupada explained that verse, because that's all practically that's all Prabhupada was explaining. Then finally, especially in New Vrindavan, I, because New Vrindavan was uh, there was one devotee named Bhagavan Das. Actually, he was Bhakti Bill when we went there. I, maybe some of you have heard of Bhagavan. And his wife, who was Irene at that time, Induvati. Uh, so we went there, and New Brindavan was a interesting place. We had to get off around here; it would be around six kilometers before we went to the temple, because the car couldn't go through the mud. So I took one step into the mud. And at that time, we didn't have shoes, we had tongs. So my tongue got stuck in the mud. So three hours later, we finally arrived at the shack. And at that time, Hari Griva, they were having Arti. So Hari Griva had been to India, and Arti was like the temples in Vrindavan. They, he had bought, bought back these gongs. These gongs are bang, wing, and we go, Rah! the sound, you know, you, you couldn't hear yourself think. <laughs> and my, you know, my brain was going gong, gong. <laughs> and then Bhagavan Prabhu and myself, we went up to see Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Prabhupada was sitting on a bed in the attic, and he turned to me and he said, so, how do you like our jungle? And I lived in, in New Vrindavan for three or four days. And to take a shower, well, there was no showers. To take a bath, <laughs> you had to walk a kilometer. It was called Ag uh, Agrasura's Hole, I believe. <laughs> so you took a bath, and then to t you had to walk down this hill into the water but the hill was all muddy so you're all muddy by the time you got to the water so you took a, a, a bath in the water which was all muddy also <laughs> and then you walked up the hill and got even more muddy <laughs> <laughs> so after three or four days of that I was trying to think maybe I'm not this body <laughs> <laughs> all these realizations were coming <laughs> And then it was time for initiation. Prabhupada was going to give initiation. And Purushatam, who was Prabhupada's secretary, came over to me and said that Prabhupada's going to give initiation. Bhakti Bill and Irene, they were going to get married or initiated. And then Madhaji came up to me and said, Prabhupada said that I'm going to get second initiation. And then Jagadish Prabhu told me he's going to get second initiation. And then Purusha time said, ask me to build a fire sacrifice. And I was building it. I was setting up the sticks and thinking, 
my God, why am I not getting second initiation? <laughs> so then it was all set up. And then Purusha Time said, oh, you're also getting second initiation. So Prabhupada did the fire sacrifice. And Kirtananda came over, Kirtananda Maharaj at that time, he came over to me and said, because uh, I was the treasurer in the temple. That was as soon as I joined the Hare Krishna movement, as soon as I moved into the temple, I became two things, even before I was initiated. First, I became the treasurer, and then immediately I became the head pujari. As I said before, the only problem was I didn't know who the deities were. <laughs> we had no RT, we didn't know how to worship the deities, and I didn't know who they are. So it was easy to be a head pujari back then. <laughs> then, so Kirtananda Maharaj came up to me and said, so which feast do you want? Do you want the $5 feast or the $10 feast? So $5 back then was quite a bit of Lakshmi, and $10 is twice as much. So he said the $5 feast, of course. But the $5 fees was probably the same thing as the $10 fees. <laughs> so Kirtananda Maharaj was actually a fabulous cook. And they cooked on wood outside the, the shack. And he, they made apple chutney and sweet rice for the feast. And it was actually quite an... I mean, devotees had enormous appetites back then. We'd eat ourselves after the fire sacrifice and everything else we more or less eat ourselves to sleep Fab fantastic amounts of sweet rice in any case Nubranda, the realizations of the difference between oneself and the body and what is the holy name this was actually it's a gradual process that it takes some austerity, some practice, suitable practice, and detachment, and then gradually we might be able to understand what is the difference between ourselves and this body, and why are we sleeping in this illusory existence called Maya. And as, long, as much as we're asleep, why we can't actually realize Krishna. And Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Bhoktaram Jagatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarabhutanam Gyatvamam Shantirichiti. The sages who know me as the ultimate enjoyer of all sacrifices and austerities, the Supreme Lord of all planets and demigods, and the ultimate benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities attain peace from the pangs of material misery. So, in the material dream or the material concept of life, we don't see everything here as Krishna's property. We hear that Krishna has some property which is very valuable in Vaikuntha. He has another estate in Goloka Vrindavan. And he has a few places here in the material world, like Sweta Dweep, where he lies on the ocean of milk. So he has some residential places, and I have my residential place. He has a few stocks and bonds, and I have a few stocks and bonds. He has this, and I have that. So it's very hard for us to conceive that everything is actually Krishna's property. Even this body that I think is mine, is actually not mine, it's Krishna's. Even the activities that I think I'm doing, I'm actually not doing. It's all being arranged either by the material energy or the spiritual energy according to what I deserve and desire. So our dream is that we're floating in this illusion of how I have this, other people have that. And then the other stage of illusion is what I can do to make me happy in this world. 
Of course, Krishna Bhagavad Gita says, Nashtabudhya yuktasya, Nacha yuktasya bhavanaha, Nacha bhavyantak shantir, Ashantasya kutaksuka. That for one who is not in the divine consciousness, Krishna consciousness, can have neither a controlled mind nor steady intelligence without which there is no possibility of peace and how can there be any happiness without peace so unless one is perfectly in consciousness of Krishna there can be no clear vision of reality nor can there be any steady mind our mind will simply flicker from this thought to that thought and therefore we can't be peaceful as long as we're identifying ourselves with being part of this material world even to some degree we're going to be in anxiety what my future is and if we're not peaceful where is there any question of happiness and why are we not peaceful because and why are we not our minds are not focused on Krishna all the time because diete visham pumsam sangas te shu bhajayate sangas sanjayate kama kama krodo bhajayate because we've come to the material world looking for happiness and we're not getting it therefore we're looking 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 and then we find something there she is or there he is or there it is and I want it I need it this is what I'm looking for and then Maya says, yes, let me inspire you. And then she gives us the magical inspiration called lust. And then a little greed, a little frustration, a little delusion, a little forgetfulness. And then our intelligence just goes out the window and we're our dream. We live deeply in the dream of material existence. So unless we can actually practice the process of becoming conscious of Krishna and eventually unless we can pit, fit all the different pieces of the puzzle together so our life becomes absorbed in Krishna consciousness without this str constant struggle against the illusory energy one moment we're in ecstasy chanting Hare Krishna the moment, next moment we're in anxiety whether we're going to pay the rent or not. One moment we think, oh, I love Krishna. And the next moment she loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. And then we find out she doesn't love me. She loves my money. <laughs> so, this constant struggle against the illusory energy is the process or to overcome this constant struggle against the illusory energy is why we're chanting Hare Krishna ultimately because whether we're aware of it or not Krishna is actually present to the degree that we can chant Hare Krishna of course Krishna is present everywhere but as, as much as we give up this idea that everything is or something is ours by utilizing whatever we think is ours and engaging that in this Sankirtan movement as much as we give up this idea that I can enjoy separate from making Krishna and his devotees happy as much as we give up this idea that I'm the doer and therefore by my mercy I'm benedicting so many people rather than being simply an instrument the previous acharyas as much as we can give up these false conceptions then we can actually hear the holy name but it's not just hearing the holy name it's actually experiencing Krishna not only with our ears but with our heart with all our senses because the holy name is full of transcendental bliss for all the senses the tongue, the, uh, the eyes, the ears, the touch, everything is full of bliss because Krishna is full of bliss.
Therefore, we have to practice chanting Hare Krishna and at the same time trying to put into practice the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. So what is that philosophy? Besides the fact that we're not this body, but we're actually Krishna's servants. We're all Krishna's servants. And we can realize Krishna's being Krishna's servant by becoming the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada came to the Western world and he was successful not because he had a nice business plan, not because he came at a lucky time, not because he, he established his center in the right place, although it was the right place. He came because he was, and he still is, was, is a servant of the servant of Krishna. Gopi Bharata Padakamalayor Dasa Dasa Anudasa. The whole spiritual consciousness, the whole spiritual world is situated in pure loving service to Krishna and his devotees. And because Srila Prabhupada had realized that, that he should become a servant of his spiritual master in the simple succession. And what is that service? Service to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. In this age, service to Krishna means service to the Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. And what is that service, as we heard when I came up here? Yari Deka Tari Kaha Krishna Upadesh Amar Agai Guruhana Tari Desh. Whoever we meet, we should see them or try to see them. It's not so easy. Maya has already given us a whole fairy tale, a whole story that we're living in. And it seems completely normal and natural. We can't conceive of an, any other story except for the story we, we believe we're living in. So we meet friends, we meet enemies, we meet people who we're indifferent to, we meet people who are impartial towards us, we meet so many people and we have a whole story behind who we think they are. And generally they're everyone but Krishna's servants. So we have to believe, at least theoretically, that everyone we meet, and that doesn't mean just people on the outside or people we don't know, it means whoever we meet, including our family members, including our children, including our, even our, the animals, the insects, we have to believe they're all actually spiritual souls, immaterial bodies, and that my relationship with them is to be their servant by helping them become conscious of Krishna, by reawakening their eternal relation with Krishna. That's my only business in this material world. When we become convinced that I have nothing else to do than to serve others by helping them become conscious of their relation with Krishna, then we make progress in devotional service. Any other consciousness is simply a product of the illusory energy. There's no other relationship that's valid except for being Gopi Bharata Pada Kamalayor Dasa Dasa Anudasa. And we have to look and see those devotees who are in that consciousness, in that mood of trying to help others become conscious of Krishna and learn from them how to improve my understanding my activities, my conceptions, so that I can become a better servant of the servants of the servants of Krishna and help others become ser better servants of the servants of the servants of Krishna. And Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tattvataha tektvadeham janma that one who can understand 
my activities and my appearance in truth by experience. They don't take birth again in this material world, but they go back to the spiritual world. So, in this age, it's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance and activities are all meant simply to revive people's consciousness of Krishna, especially through the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So when we're chanting Hare Krishna, what are we supposed to be doing? One time I wrote to Srila Prabhupada and I asked him, can I remember Krishna's pastimes when I chant Hare Krishna? Because I was this, I was in Houston when, in 1970 when I wrote Srila Prabhupada this letter, 71, Houston, Texas, in America. And I actually didn't like chanting so much. But I liked remembering Krishna's pastimes. Somehow or another, Krishna gave me a good memory. So I'd simply sit there and chant Hare Krishna, and I remember Krishna's pastimes. So I asked the devotees in the temple. We only had three devotees in the temple. I said, is that all right? And one devotee said, well, it's better than remembering other things. <laughs> but I wasn't quite sure. So I wrote to Srila Prabhupada. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, oh, Prabhupada write back some letter saying, you know, oh, I'm so happy that you're such an advanced devotee, you're remembering Krishna's past. So Prabhupada wrote me back a rather short letter and said, as far as you question whether we should remember Krishna's past signs when we're chanting Hare Krishna, he said, no. He said, we should simply chant and hear, and if Krishna's remembrance of Krishna comes spontaneously or automatically, that is very nice, but not that we're artificially trying to remember Krishna. So, 40 years later, I'm still trying to accept that, that instruction. Not that I'm always remembering Krishna's pastimes when we're chanting Hare Krishna, but just to chant and hear, and as Prabhupada said elsewhere, try to feel Krishna's presence. We have to develop faith that Krishna is present when we chant Hare Krishna with some sincerity. Or just when we chant, when we say Hare Krishna, then Krishna is present, and when we say Hare Krishna without offense, we'll realize it. Or gradually we'll realize it the less, the more we get free from the ten offenses. And to do that, we have to become submissive. We have to become free from anxiety. It's very difficult for us to give up our anxieties. We're like so conditioned by anxiety, we'd worry if we didn't have any anxiety. I remember one time, Prabhupada, Shul Prabhupada came to Boston, this is in 1969. And the devotees from Buffalo, we first went to New York City, and then we went up to see Srila Prabhupada coming to the Boston Temple. The devotees just bought a new temple on Beacon Street, first large temple in ISKCON, and it was going to house the first BBT, a printing press, actually. So we went there, and we were on the, it was a two-story building, which was quite, nice building. We were doing bhajan, some devotees were doing bhajan upstairs, and suddenly I was looking at a picture of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who was ha hanging by the stairs. Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had his hands out like this in the picture. The Sankirtan party was in back of him, and suddenly the, the picture started to glow. And then suddenly I saw Srila Prabhupada walk up the steps and the whole room turned into Vaikuntha. And I was, all the devotees were in Vaikuntha. And Srila Prabhupada sat on the Vyasa sign and glanced at me and I could see, he could actually see me as a spiritual soul. And then I was trying to remember, what was I worrying about? 
I couldn't remember what I was worrying about. And Prabhupada talked, it was on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada's, I believe it's his disappearance day. And Prabhupada was telling many stories about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. And it, I felt very emotional. And it was completely in this, you know, what I felt as close to the spiritual world as I had gotten to at that time. And then Prabhupada left, and I was back in the material world again. And then I began, I remember what I was worrying about. I felt, oh, back to my worries again. So we're so accustomed to worrying. One time I was sitting in the garden with Srila Prabhupada in Los Angeles. And Prabhupada looked at me and said, uh, he pointed to the tree. It was getting actually dark. And Prabhupada looked, pointed to the tree and said, do you see the bird in the tree? So I didn't see any bird, but I figured Prabhupada told me there was a bird. I had to have enough faith that there was a bird. So I said, yes, Prabhupada. <laughs> I didn't get up and verify if there was a bird, you know. So Prabhupada said, look at that. See that bird in that tree? He's not, a, he's not worrying. Every day he gets, the, he gets a worm. And he, gets, he has a tree. He has a place to stay. And then Prabhupada asked, so why are you worrying? The Krishna won't take care of you. He's taking care of this little bird. So we're so accustomed to worrying that we don't even know when we're worrying. And then when we're not worrying, we're worrying. Why am I not worrying? There must be something of that I'm supposed to worry about. <laughs> Let me take out my pad, my pencil, or my, my iPad, whatever, and you know, think about what am I supposed to be worrying about right now? There's something, my life is, I'm unproductive. I'm not fulfilling my worries. No, we're actually Masuchaha. Krishna says, give up all this worrying. Yes, if we're identifying with this body, there's plenty to worry about. Because unfortunately, this body doesn't last forever. One time they asked the reporters asked Srila Prabhupada, they said, Swamiji, why in India? the death rate is so high. And then Prabhupada looked at him and said, well, actually, wherever I go, the death rate is the same. It's 100%. <laughs> so it's not like in India, everyone is dying, but in the Western world, people live forever. <laughs> the death rate is equal everywhere. And it hasn't improved even since Prabhupada was here. It's still 100%. So this body is going to die. It doesn't matter how much we're going to worry about it and take care of it. Not that we shouldn't take care of it. We have to maintain the body for Krishna's service because it's not our body. It belongs to Krishna. And therefore it should be utilized for Krishna's service as nicely, it should be maintained as nicely as possible so we can do the nicest possible service. But not that we're maintaining it so we can live forever. We're maintaining it so that we can live forever. We can realize that we're eternal and therefore we should be full, free from all anxiety. And when we're free from anxiety, then we can actually listen to the holy name. We'll have time for the holy name to listen to it and to actually feel it. Krishna's presence, the presence of his associates. And then spontaneously, we'll remember Krishna's form, his quality, his pastimes, all these things will be experienced by us because Krishna will didami buddhi yogam tam. If we have room for Krishna, then Krishna will give us the intelligence so that we can make progress in becoming conscious of him and learn how to become a better servant of Krishna. How to get more transcendental discrimination so that we know more expertly how to attract people to Krishna, how to get more transcendental knowledge so that we can actually see what is my position, how wonderful Krishna is, and we can present Krishna in a more and more attractive way appropriately for time, place, and circumstance for others. We can watch Krishna delivering not only others, 
but we can watch Krishna deliver ourselves. As I said this morning in the class, one time I wrote to Srila Prabhupada because I had asked him, how does Baba turn into Prema? This is in 1969. Well, because at that particular time, we didn't have any books. We didn't even have the little blue Bhagavad Gita yet. And so there was one book. It was the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that our temple president had received somehow or another. And my temple president told me I should not read that book. So, of course, that was the first book I wanted to read. <laughs> I wanted to find out why did he want, not want me to read that book. So, when everyone went to sleep at night, I got up to read the book. And I got up to the part where it was dealing, the first 19 chapters deal with more or less from Shraddha to Prema. So, I got up to the part of Baba Bhakti, and then I got up to the last. I think the 19th chapter deals with pure love of God. So I was wondering, how does Baba turn into Prema? So I wrote to Srila Prabhupada and I said, uh, I was sending him a check. I was the treasurer. So whenever I got some money selling his Bhagavad Gita at that time, the blue Bhagavad Gita, I'd send him some, whatever money we made, we'd send him a check for it. So in one of the letters I sent him, I asked, how does Baba, how does Baba turn into Prema? So Prabhupada wrote me back a page and a half letter. And the first part of that was simply go out and continue to do Harinam, which we were doing eight hours a day. And then he said, also distribute my Bhagavad Gita, these blue Bhagavad Gitas. I was waiting for the answer to my question. And then in the same page he said that the boys and girls in your country, they're generally good souls. That's why they've uh, generally good souls. And if they engage whatever they have in Krishna's service, that will make everything complete. That I heard in New York in just two weeks, they've distributed 3,000 back to Godheads. And that in Buffalo, you're also distributing Bhagavad Gita, uh, back to Godhead very nicely. So please continue in this way and your success in life is assured. As Krishna sees that you're working seriously to bring his other children back to the spiritual kingdom, then he'll bestow all his blessings upon you. That Krishna is never ungrateful for our efforts to serve him, rest assured. So this is the secret of the holy name descending, of course, revealing himself to us is to become serious about his mission, the mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of distributing Krishna consciousness to others. And then at the end of the letter, Prabhupada wrote to me, he said, you said that you enclosed $50, but I don't find $50 in the envelope. And as far as your question goes, how does Baba Shakti turn into Prema? There is no need to trouble yourself over such advanced topics of the present time that soon my book, Nectar Devotion, will come out and it will be explained there. We may think of so many different ways of how to become perfect. We may think of so many different ways to chant Hare Krishna. But ultimately, we have to become absorbed in the mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Not once a week, not twice a week, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, which means that even our house, it has to become, as Shilvaktu Notakor said, I went, entered into my house and it turned into Goloka Vrindavan. I was taking Jaranamrita and it became the river Ganges. It's a consciousness, it's a mood of service, service to presenting Krishna consciousness to everyone we come in contact with and remain absorbed in that mood of constantly being the servant of the servants of the servants of Krishna 
instance of his accession. Of everything we do, everything we say, everything we think is simply a service to our spiritual masters in the civil succession, especially for coming from Srila Prabhupada and our previous acharyas through the six Goswamis to the Panchatattva. And if we do that, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his servants will reveal to us these feelings of separation from Krishna in Vrindavan. Or as the, uh, one of my favorite stories, or Prabhupada writes in the Krishna book in chapter 35, the gopis of Vrindavan were so attached to Krishna that they were not satisfied simply with the rasa dance at night. They wanted to associate with him and enjoy his company during the daytime also. When Krishna went to the forest with his cowherd boys and the calves, the gopis could not physically take part, but their hearts went with him. And because their hearts went, they were able to enjoy his company through these strong feelings of separation. To acquire these strong feelings of separation is the teachings of Lord Chaitanya and his direct disciples succession of Goswamis. When we are not in physical contact with Krishna, we can also associate with him through these strong feelings of separation. Krishna's transcendental form, his quality, his pastime, his entourage are all identical with him. There are nine different kinds of devotional service and devotional service to Krishna and the feelings of separation elevates the devotee to the highest devotional perfection to the level of the gopis. As stated in the prayers of Srinivasacharya to the six Goswamis, they gave up the uh, aristocratic the material opulence and aristocratic status of life and went to Vrindavan where they lived like ordinary mendicants begging from door to door. But they were so much enriched with the gopis' feelings of separation that they enjoyed transcendental pleasure at every moment. Similarly, when Lord Chaitanya was at Jagannath Puri, he was in the mood of separation of Srimati Rarani. Those were in the disciples' succession the Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya should always feel the separation from Krishna. Worship his transcendental form, discuss his transcendental teachings, his entourage, his pastimes. The spiritual masters are enriched the devotees to the highest devotional perfection. Feeling constant separation while engaged in the service of Krishna is the perfection of Krishna consciousness. So our service is the spreading of the Hare Krishna movement the spreading of the Sankirtan movement, especially the wonderful philosophy, the wonderful lifestyle, the wonderful chanting of the holy names. Then we can remember, then gradually will be revealed to us how Krishna and his name are non-different, how Krishna and his form is, no, is non-different, how Krishna and his activities are non-different, then we'll be able to relish Krishna's holy name, service to the deities, service to the devotees, service to the Dham, the spiritual places, service to the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. Then we can listen to the pastimes when Krishna was walking on the bank of the Jamuna. He was nicely decorated with tilak on his forehead and he was garlanded with different kinds of forest flowers and tulsi leaves. The bumblebees became mad after the treasure and sweetness of the atmosphere and being pleased by the humming sound of the bees, Krishna began to blow upon his flute and the combined sounds became so sweet to hear that the aquatic birds like the cranes, the ducks and the swans stopped swimming and flying and closed their eyes and entered into a meditation and worship of Krishna. So such pastimes of Krishna were remembered by the gopis during his absence from Vrindavan. They give us some idea how attractive Krishna is, not only to all animate, but also to the inanimate living entities. In Vrindavan, everything and everyone is attracted to Krishna, including the trees, the plants, the lakes, and the animals such as the cows and the deer. 
That is the perfect description of Krishna's all attractiveness. The example of the gopis is very instructive to those who are trying to become fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness. That simply by remembering Krishna's pastimes, one can become fully Krishna conscious. Everyone has a tendency to love someone. That Krishna should be the object of love is the central point of Krishna consciousness. By constantly chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and remembering the transcendental passions of Krishna, everyone could become fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness and thus make his life sublime and fruitful. So this is our message. It's a very simple message. It's being handed to us by our acharyas and disciples succession. And if we hear it, if we accept it, if we practice it, then surely one day or gradually, 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 we'll become conscious of Krishna and that way we'll become peaceful, happy, ecstatic, and everything will be revealed to us and our lives will become completely successful. Thank you. Hare Krishna. I don't think we have time for questions. Do I have questions? What's it? Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, eight words. Mayeva mana adhastva. Mayi buddhim niveshaya. Nivesi shesha mayeva. So this verse uh, defines chanting of the holy names and exactly chanting is uh, mentioned in it. So the like concentration of mind and uh, intellect. So in this age of Kali, when there is so much of disturbance everywhere going on, Maya is acting so much on us. Uh, how can we concentrate on chanting so that our uh, chanting will be sent percent and we can um, uh, have that uh, benefit of chanting. If we can uh, preach, please Krishna by chanting. Well, we, we first of all, we concentrate on service to Krishna. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Chaita Sasarva Karmani, Maya Sanyasi Matparaha, Buddhi Yogamu Pashitya, Matshita Satatam Bhava. And all activities depend upon me, work always on my, under my protection, and such devotional service be fully conscious of me. So our vision is everything belongs to Krishna. So what is there to worry about? And we want to find out how Krishna wants us to use his energies. And that's possible, in our case, by hearing from Bhagavad Gita, as Krishna spoke it, and from Krishna's representatives. And then, Prabhupada writes this word, Matparaha, is very important. That one should have no goal in life, save and accept, act in Krishna consciousness, just to satisfy Krishna. And we're working in such a way, one should think of Krishna only that I've been appointed to discharge this particular duty by Krishna and I'm doing it just to please him. And then w one will naturally think about Krishna. So this is perfect Krishna consciousness. So chanting is one of our services, but it has to be done with the background that I've been asked to do this by Krishna's representatives and I'm doing it just to please him. Then when we do it as a service to Krishna's servants, then the result will be that naturally we'll remember Krishna when we're chanting. And the more we remember Krishna when we're chanting, the more we feel his presence, the more we develop a taste, then everything else will seem insignificant. Otherwise, if we chant but we don't feel Krishna's presence, then we'll become very easily distracted by so many other things. So practice, but suitable practice and detachment. Anything else? Okay, announcements. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 
So before we have Kirtan, one very pleasant announcement. Uh, uh, <coughs> one very wonderful couple, 